Happy Sabbath. Once again, I am glad that this is the day that the Lord has made. And let us rejoice and be glad ye in it. One writer says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I pray that you are glad to be here. My heart is filled with gratitude this morning because I have a word from the Lord for you. Before I get to the word from the Lord for you, let me get some business out of the way. Um, we are here to serve you. And I know that you have needs. You have prayers that need to be prayed. You have questions that need to be answered. I want you to know that we are available for you. You reach out and we reach up to God together. So feel free to get in touch. Call me because I am here to serve you, to serve your family, to serve your needs. So please do not hold back. You know, come in, in, in full force. I have time for you. Uh, the second thing is, I know you have questions, questions that relate either to the sermons we present or some other biblical questions. And I want to be of service to you and answer those questions. So every, every day from Monday to Friday, I'm going to be on Instagram doing an Instagram takeover where I'm going to be answering your questions, whatever they may be, whatever they, 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 they whatever you want to be answered, I'm going to answer them there on Instagram and and maybe, hey, Instagram may not work for you. You just want to, you know, shoot the question at me directly. That's also okay. Because I believe that a dose of heavenly wisdom is going to make us all the more wiser as we live uh, for God. So, with that, with, that, with that business out of the way, I want to get back into our main business for today. And that is our series called The New Normal. As you know, last week we beat the beat saying keep moving. Uh, that simply means that do not be in a location that God has not destined for you, but rather move to the location that God has destined for you. In other words, do not do what you want to do, but rather do what God has intended for you to do and you'll be blessed. Uh, this morning I've chosen as our text of concentration and meditation and reflection, Jeremiah chapter 21 verses 1 to 14. I'm going to pause to give you a little time to get to Jeremiah 29 verses 1 to 14. Okay, pause is over. I think you've gotten there. Uh, the people of Judah, they are deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. They are deported from the city of peace, Yerushalayim, uh, to the city of confusion, Vavel. And you see, they are thrust into a new normal that they didn't expect. And sometimes when we are thrust into a new normal, we are confused. We live a life of calm and we transition into a life of chaos. We live a life of tranquility and we transition into a life of trouble. We, we transverse from calm at, at sea into a storm at sea. And this morning, this is what the people of Judah, they are going through in Jeremiah chapter 29. And I bet that somebody who is listening to me is also going through a struggle and a challenge. And Jeremiah chapter 21, 29 is the passage for you this morning. Uh, let us read it together, beginning in verse number 1. And I want to take it all the way down to verse number 4. But we're going to spend our time in the whole passage until verse 14 this morning. The word of God says, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captives or captive. And that simply means to say exiles or deportees. To the priests, the prophets, and all the elders whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was an open letter to every deportee. Whether you were a king, whether you're a priest, whether you're a prophet, or whether you're a common folk, Jeremiah addressed them. 
Verse 2 helps us to understand when Jeremiah sends the letter. It says that this happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. Verse 3 says, the letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon. I just love all the ah, ah, ah right there. To Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, thus saith the Lord, or thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. To all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. The message is tagged as simply, be okay with God's way. Be okay with God's way. Let us pray. Oh God, I thank you for this moment, for this opportunity. Take over, Lord. Take over these eyes. Take over this mind, take over this mouth, and use me for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Have your parents ever done something you were not okay with? Have they put you in a situation you were not okay with? My parents placed me and my little brother in a group home. A group home is a, an, a facility that takes, takes in at-risk youth. You see, in Blacksburg, Virginia, I was an at-risk youth. My gang of friends, my, my behavior, my skipping school, my playing around sometimes with a little smoke, my shoplifting put me at risk as a youth. You see, my parents, because of their busy schedule, created ghosts at home. And they realized that unless we do something for Henry and his little brother Mark, Jr., they are going to be destroyed. So my father enrolled me and my little brother in a group home, not 30 minutes away, not one hour away, not an hour and a half away, not two hours away, not two and a half hours away, but three hours away. He moved me and my little brother from Blacksburg, Virginia to Covington, Virginia. That three hour journey, it felt like an eternity. We arrived in Covington, Virginia, a little town, a little milling town, and we passed through Covington, Virginia. It had a funny smell because of the mill. I didn't like it. We started traversing through a road that, read up, that led up a mountain I didn't like it because in Blacksburg there were no mountains. We descended into a valley. I didn't like it because in Blacksburg there was no valleys. And we got to a, 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 a campus called the Boys Home. It was situated on, on top of a hill. In fact, we used to call that the hill. It was situated at the hill and there was nothing but trees and creeks and uh, stalls and places for cattle and horses. And to be honest, like a, a, a black kid who is used to uh, the city, I'm like, man, I'm in the wild, wild west. I mean, I am in the country right now. My father pulled up, he turned in, and he brought us to the, the first building. This was the kind of like a checking you and analyzing you facility. And there, uh, he, 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 we got out of the car, we took our bags, we entered the facility, and we were introduced and we were greeted. And then we were led to our rooms. I was in one room, my brother would be in another room. And we had 
two weeks to be analyzed and studied to see if we're fit to enter the program. And there my dad sat me and my little brother at the time. I was a young little kid at the age of 14, I think, at, at, at the time. And he sat me and my little brother, and I was on one side, and my little brother was on another side. He put his arms around us, embraced us. He looked at me, he looked at my little brother, and he says, this is going to be your new home now. You better be okay with it. See, par African parents don't know how to sweet talk you. They just come all in your face like onions. So there I was in a new environment. There I was in a new place. I didn't like it, but I had to be okay with it. You see, I have come to learn and to understand that a lot of times we are not okay with the way that God relates with us. We are not okay with his way. We like our own way. And so sometimes when God changes the situation and he brings us into a place that we are not prepared for or that we do not want, we are not okay with it. And here in our story, the heartbeat of our passage is that we have a nation that is not okay with being exiled they have been deported to Babylon but that is God's way for them at that particular moment God has intended for them to follow the way of a difficulty so that he can be able to reach them so that he can be able to to minister unto them it is in the way of a struggle it is in the way of difficulty it is in the way of challenge that sometimes God will lead us in and here in the passage, we have this nation that is led into a, a, a situation that they're not okay with, but they have to learn to be okay with it. Allow me to just bring you a little closer into the world of those prophets who were carried away into Babylon. Allow me to bring you for a second into the life of that king, Jeconiah, and his mother who were carried away to Babylon. Allow me to talk about the, 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 the priest and, and allow me to talk about those simple common folk in fact the text says in Jeremiah 52 that uh, Babylon uh, Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylon 3,000 people and there they are thrusted in this new situation in this new environment something that they are not ready for something that they do not like but they have to be okay with it and there they are they are walking from Jerusalem to Babylon from confusion from peace to confusion they have to travel over a thousand kilometers they are on foot. They have to walk through the desert. And, 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 and it is cold throughout the desert. And I want to imagine that a journey of a thousand kilometers took more than a week. I want to imagine that a journey of a thousand kilometers took more than 30 minutes. I want to imagine that a journey of a thousand kilometers took more than an eight our plane ride. It was a tough situation. There the king has no throne. There the queen mother has lost her influence. There the prophet has no more people to preach to. There the priest has no more animals to sacrifice and to administer. The situation had changed. And I'm talking to somebody here who is on the journey from peace to confusion who is in pieces because the situation is not what you envision you didn't dream for it you didn't want it to be like this but this is where you are and here we have the people of God uh, led in a way of God that is not really okay uh, to them we must ask a very important question uh, this morning uh, what should we know about God's way God's way stings with adversity. God's way bites with adversity. God's ways amputates with adversity. I played American football in school, and American football is a cousin, is the older brother of rugby, to all you rugby fans out there. You see, we got a new coach in my junior year. So I was in the 11th grade, and we got a new coach, Coach Baker. I loved Coach Baker. He came to change the culture of our team. Our team was a mediocre team. Our team, you know, we didn't push ourselves too hard, but he came from a military background, and he was a no-nonsense. And the first 
rule of Coach Baker. He engraved it like uh, writing on the Ten Commandments. He said, don't ever be late. He wrote it. He said it. He preached it. So one day, I got an injury. And because of football, the nature of the game, it's, 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 it's physical, it's difficult. Um, and sometimes you, you get bruises and, and you get breaks and you, you get sprains. And so I was making a move on the field and I twisted my ankle. And one of the ways in which we dealt with injuries was to use sports tape or kinesio, kinesio tape where the, the, you are taped. And our school had hired a lady trainer. Now, as the boys on the team, because uh, a football team is all boys and we are about 52 of us, and then we have this lady trainer, all of us are trying to make an impression. In fact, we would compete uh, to see who would impress her the most. Now, you just couldn't go see her. You had to go see her with a, with a reason, and your reason had to be injury. And I have an ankle injury, and so I had reason to go and see her. But I could not be late for practice. So the coach said, if you got to get tape, make sure that you ask your teacher, because our last period was ended about 3.15 in the afternoon. And so from, from where my last class was in, in campus to, to walk to the, to the locker room and where our field house was, where we, you know, we, we dressed up, it, it took at least 10 minutes. And so I would ask the teacher early, hey, uh, ma'am, sir, can I please go because I have practice and I need to go get taped and, you know, I have to get taped, so, you know, I got to go. And, and so... He said, ask your teachers to let you off early. And so I did that. I asked my, 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 last, my last class teacher. I think I was even taking chemistry at the time. So I asked her. I said, I need to go get taped. And so I go to get taped. But the coach also instructed us, when you go get taped, make sure that you have already dressed. You have put on your, your pads and your pants. Make sure that you know, you're ready, your, your cleats and all that is ready so that when you're, when you're taped, you need to just head on to the field because it also took like five minutes to get to the field. So I'm there. Uh, I'm excited because it's my time to go meet the trainer, you know, and I, I, my, my head wasn't thinking correctly. I just went straight to her office, to her trainer, uh, training room, and I said, hey, uh, uh, listen, I, I got an ankle. Can you take care of it? She said, yeah, sure, I can do that. So she, she plopped me up on the, on the bench, and I sat there, you know, took off my shoe and everything, and she looked at it. She said, ah, okay, you can play on this, and she taped it up nicely, and after she taped, she taped it up, I started to ask her questions, and, and, you know, I was like, hey, so how you doing, and things like that, and, you know, she actually entertained my conversation, so I thought I'm making moves, you understand what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm like this is good, I'm, I'm doing something. Then she dropped the words, Henry, practice in five minutes. I'm like, what? You gotta go. So I I, ru I rushed I rushed to the, the the locker room, and in order for you to put on pads, and to put on a helmet, and to put on your 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 shoulder pads, and to put on your cleats, it takes more than five minutes. And I'm rushing to get ready because I know Coach Baker says you should never be late. You should never be late. And I leave the locker room, and I'm I'm panting now, trying to get to the to the field. And I arrived at the field five minutes late. And the moment I stepped on the grass. I saw Coach Baker running towards me, and Coach Baker says to me, Henry, in my face, Henry, you are a senior, and you are a starter? How can you be late? I'm sick of you right now. I'm like, you, you're making me sick right now. Like, like how do you expect the, the freshmen and the sophomores and the juniors to follow your example if you're not going to lead? And so he said, get out of my face, and I want you to run around the field. And I ran for an hour and a half. An hour and 15 minutes, I ran the whole practice. And after an hour and 15 minutes, my coach uh, calls me up, Coach Baker. He says, Henry, stop running. Come over here. You know, I, I wanted you to learn a lesson. I wanted you to learn a lesson that it doesn't matter your position on the team. It doesn't matter who you are on the team. 
But each and every person deserves to be disciplined. That day, Coach Baker stung me with the, the sting of adversity. I learned that day that it doesn't matter what position I'm in. And I want to bring it to this particular situation because God stings us with adversity. It doesn't matter how long you have been a Christian. It doesn't matter how much tithe you give. It doesn't matter how much preaching you do. It doesn't matter how much singing you do. But God is not going to, uh, he's not going to hold back if he needs to sting you. And look at verse number 4 with me for a second in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse number 4. Uh, the word of God says, I have caused you, God says, I have caused you. This is stated in a, in, in, a, in a way to help us to understand that it is me. It is not Nebuchadnezzar. It is not the Babylonians. It is me who has caused you to go to Babylon. I have put you in adversity. I have done it. I want you to understand, brother and sister, some of the difficulties you are facing, not having finances, uh, being in a situation where you are, you are sick and things are not working out. Uh, sometimes God is the one who pushes the button and he makes that happen in our lives. Yes, I will say it again. We are stung a lot of times because uh, of the choices we make. You see, I knew clearly what the coach said. Do not be late. But I wanted to chat and be cute with the trainer. And I was cute and I chatted with the trainer. But it wasn't cute. It wasn't nice to be running in practice and, and my teammates laughing at me. I want you to see that the reason why God caused the Israelites to go into captivity, it is not because he hated them. It is not because he, he didn't like them. But for 23 years, this man called it Jeremiah preached the message of God. He talked to them. He talked to them. He talked to them. But he didn't listen. And therefore God a lot of times is left with no choice. He has to put us in a situation that helps us to understand that unless I change, I will not be changed. And so you are in a difficulty. It's not working out. It doesn't make sense. That's God's way of saying hello. Remember me? My name is God. In fact, I love the text when God says, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. I want you to understand you are not the God in your life. You are not the one in charge of your life. It is God who is in charge of your life. And therefore, he has the right. Mm -hmm. He has the right uh, to lead you in the way that you should, you should go. And you should be all right with that. Allow God to be the headlight in your life and to lead you in the way that you should go. But I'm wondering this morning, Lord, why adversity? Why should this happen? And, and that's the point. God simply wants to get your attention. And I believe that one of the things that COVID-19 has been a blessing is that it has taught us to remember what life is all about. It has, helped, it, has, it has helped us to appreciate what, what is important in, in life. And that is not making money. It's not about, it's not about going out. You know, it's, it's not about that. It has helped us to understand that you know, life is, 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 is more, uh, more important when it is focused on God. And, and many of you have used this opportunity. I, I want to believe that. You have used this opportunity to actually get closer to God. And, and that's the beautiful thing about adversity because it, 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 it wakes us up. You see, there are two ways you can respond to adversity. You can be proud or you can be humbled. Uh, follow what I'm saying. I just want to talk to you for a moment. Let me not preach a little bit. Let me talk to you. Uh, you see, the reason why Jeremiah sent the letter it's because some people felt, Lord, we are the chosen people. We are the Israelites. God, we are the people that you, you saw through Egypt and you have given us the temple. You have given us the commandments. We are the chosen ones. We are the good ones. And so they felt that God was not going to allow them to suffer long in this particular situation. And so some people were saying, hey, this thing is going to be for a short time. And let's not worry about the Babylonians. They are foolish. They are crazy. But God sends the letter to the Babylonians, I mean to the Israelites in Babylon, uh, to let them know, wait a minute, slow down. 
You need to humble yourself for this particular moment. You see, so when God has brought a situation in your life that you do not like, you're not okay with, it's not a time to puff up and say, you know what, God, how could you be so mean to me? I have, I have had friends who have come to me and say, you know what, Henry, I'm mad at God. I'm like, why are you mad at God? Oh, I don't know. You know, we're just having this season with God. I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm telling myself, I'm like, man, you got to be out of your mind to think that you can be mad at God and, and say, ah, we're just not having a good moment. We treat God as if he's your, your best. Yes, God is your friend. It is true, but he is God. And so when situations have not worked out in your life, don't poke yourself. God, you, you, you. No, it's not that. It's Lord, there is something that you're trying to produce in this situation. I remember that day when I'm running. You see, some of my teammates, the, the upperclassmen, because you see, let me, let me just break it down for you so you understand. You see, as a senior on a football team, you know, you, you had the right to tell a, a junior or a sophomore or a freshman to move out of your seat. And me, I always sat in the back of the bus. And if there was a, senior, a junior in, in, in my seat, I'll tell them straight, get out. <laughs> you got to go, brother. Get, you you got to go to the front. And so we have these juniors that are there, you know, watching me running. The senior, the, this pompous guy. And they're like, look look at this fool, man. He, he didn't keep the rules and he's being showed up. It humbled me, to be honest with you. And it made me realize uh, I'm just like everyone else. Because you see, I loved Coach Baker. Yes, I loved him and he loved me too. Because one time Coach Baker says to the whole team about Henry Temple. He says, Henry Temple is the most coachable player. And you have to think of it yourself. Man, when a coach says you're most coachable, it means that you, you're really in line with the coach. And the coach has said that to me, about me, to the whole team. And yet on this day, I'm running around. My brother and my sister, I was humble that day. I didn't leave practice like, yo, I'm the man. I left practice like feeling, man, I'm just a man. <laughs> and somebody here needs to know you are not the man. You are just a man. Somebody here needs to know you're not the woman. You are just a woman. Somebody needs to know you're not the preacher. You are just a preacher. Somebody needs to know that you are not the leader. You are just a leader. God is the man. God is the woman. God is the pastor. God is the leader. He is the one. You and me, we should be humble enough to accept, Lord, <laughs> I'm just a man. Somebody say amen. amen. See, we need to learn to say like Job. Shall we indeed accept Job 2.10? Shall we indeed accept good from, uh, from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job is basically saying, look, God gives good and God gives bad. And sometimes when God gives bad, it's because he wants to do you good. So I'll say that again so you can treat it. Sometimes when God does you bad, it's because he wants to do you good. Uh, you know, me and my friends in high school, man, we, we used to do funny stuff. We, we, we see a beautiful girl. We're like, yo, she is bad, man. You know, like, yo, that was a bad movie, son. And, and basically we're saying, man, that, that's, that's, that's so good. We, we would flip the situation around. And I'm here to tell you that when God looks at, at your finances and they're not, they look bad, God says, man, I'm about to do something good for you. When God looks at the situation in your family, it's not working out, it's so bad. God is like, I'm, I'm about to do something good for you. God looks at bad in a totally different way. And we need to learn this morning that we need to look at, God, at bad in the way that God sees bad because God wants to do us good. You see, adversity stings. And adversity humbles you, but an adversity also brings you to new places. You see, the people of God left Jerusalem for Babylon. They left an old city for a new city. They left an old situation for a new situation. And, and had it not been for this deportation, they wouldn't have moved to Babylon. And listen to what I'm saying, my brother and my sister. Let me break it down for you. You see, in Jerusalem, they had the temple. They had the priest. They had the king. They had the prophet. They had their homes. But having those things did not bring them closer to God. Being in the good in, in, in the in the environment that they were familiar in did not bring them closer to God. Living in Blacksburg, Virginia did not make me a better student. And so God had to move the Israelites from Jerusalem 
to Babylon because in Babylon he confused the situation but only to clear up their mind. <laughs> God took them from a bad situation, a normal situation, into a seemingly bad situation so that they could see their state and their status. Sometimes it is when we are in a difficult situation, the situation we do not like, that is when our eyes are wide open and we're able to see clearly what it is that God intends to do for us. Some of you cannot see God because of the money is blinding your eyes. Some of you cannot see God because he's always in your face or she's always in your face. Some of you cannot see God because you're always watching movies. Some of you cannot see God because you're so busy. So God I said you know what I need them to see me and I want them to see me and therefore I, I didn't bring this COVID-19 but I will use this COVID-19 so that their eyes can be open my brother and my sister when you are thrust into a new normal it's because God wants you to see him this is when I wish I was at Pacific Place man because man being alone up here is, is, is not easy but you see, that's what I need you to understand, that when he has pushed you into a new position, into a new place, and on a familiar, and familiar ground, is because he wants to do something for you that cannot be done in that place. When I moved to Covington, Virginia, I became a serious student. I started making A's. When I moved to Covington, Virginia, I became more disciplined to the point that I started to make my bed every time that I woke up in the morning. When I moved to, to, to Covington, Virginia, I started to exercise a lot more and I took my football career a little bit more serious. In fact, I was, I was offered uh, an opportunity to earn a scholarship playing football. You see, by moving into a new place, that is when I realized my full potential. That is when I realized that I could be somebody. I was not just a, a, a statistic. I was not just a, an at-risk youth. I was just, just another black kid who's not going to make it or, or do something foolish. And it's because God pushed me into that environment that, is, uh, that was preparing the ground for me to be able to stand and preach to you. Can somebody say amen? amen. I need you to understand that, oh man, it, it almost brings tears to my eyes because when I look at my story, I, I see a lost soul, but God saw a found soul and he was putting me through paces. He was putting me through races. He was putting me through places so that I could get to the place where I could see him better. Brother and sister, hear me today and I declare, your new normal, whatever it looks like, whatever it sounds like, whatever it feels like, however you see it, it is for your good. Good, and only if you embrace the adversity, God is going to bless you. But what I'm encouraged this morning is that when we embrace the sting of adversity, we are pushed into the breed of prosperity. Our adversity breeds prosperity. In other words, what is bad, it turns out to be good. In verses 5 to number 9, uh, Jeremiah tells the people, settle down. Don't rattle the cages of the Babylonians. He tells them that, look, you're in a new situation. Please forget this misguided, uh, you hear me what I'm saying? Please forget this misguided optimism. You are not going to leave Babylon anytime soon. You better sit, uh, settle down and follow this guided realism. You see, misguided optimism is to believe that your situation is going to change without taking into consideration the will of God. Let me put it another way. Blinded optimism is to think that God is going to change the situation quickly when it is in his plans not to change it quickly. Uh, this morning I got here to record and uh, I just got, I guess got word from Elder Irwan and he told me, Pastor, hang in there. And I said, why should I hang in there? Because we might go all the way to July and you still have to do live streaming. I said, my brother, <laughs> I, I, I'd rather follow guided realism. If we need to go to August, I'm cool with it. If we need to go to oh, September, I'm cool with it. If we need to go to uh, October, I'm cool with it. You see, when you have, when you have guided realism and not misguided optimism, 
optimism, what it does is it, 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 it settles you and you now begin to accept the situation. Many of us, we don't accept situations because we think, oh, today is going to happen. Today, no, it's not going to happen that day. That day, you need to live for God. That day, you need to follow his will. That day, you need to pray. That day, you need to say, Lord, I submit. I give in. You are the man. I'm just a man. And so I want you to understand that this is what Jeremiah tells the people of God. And let me slow down for a second. Jeremiah tells them in verse number 5. I love verse number 5 in Jeremiah 29. Forgive me, we didn't have a PowerPoint today because we're bringing the power into point. But that's all right. Jeremiah 29 verse number 5. The Bible says, Build ye houses and dwell in them. And plant gardens and eat of the fruit of them. He, in other words, he's saying, settle down. You in Babylon? You know what I mean? You, the houses of Jerusalem are in Jerusalem. The gardens of Jerusalem are in Jerusalem. Uh, the city square of Jerusalem is in Jerusalem. The mall of Jerusalem is in Jerusalem. You better build your, your, uh, your cost of Babylon. You, you better build your mansion of Babylon. You better plant your farm of Babylon. You better settle down. You see, God is telling them, embrace your new normal. Uh, be okay with the situation. And that is the first step to be on the road to prosperity, to prosperity. When you accept the situation and there you settle down, you figure out what can I do in this environment now? How can I live okay now? How can I settle down? How can I adjust myself? I remember uh, last year when I, I moved uh, my, uh, to another apartment, I had to adjust myself. In my new apartment, there were no uh, cafes, there was no uh, laundry mats. The, the, none of those things were not were not around. I had to walk a little further to go to the to the supermarket, and it wasn't comfortable for the first couple of weeks. You know, I just couldn't go downstairs and and buy me a drink. I had to go a little bit further. I just couldn't go sit down and and be in a cafe and work. No, I had to change. And so, my brother, and my sister, I don't know where you are in your life right now. I don't know what the new normal looks like right now. But whatever it is, find ways to normalize. I'm talking about settle down. I'm talking about sit in the chair, uh, relax, and chill because you're going to be there for a while. Hallelujah. You see, that is the first thing you need to do if you're to breed prosperity in your, your new normal. The second thing is you need to grow in your new normal. You see, God tells the Israelites in, in verse number 6, he says, take wives and beget sons and, and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters. That you may be increased there and not diminished there. Oh, listen to me, my brother and my sister. You see, the Israelites, they went to Babylon, a city of confusion. They didn't want to have babies anymore. They didn't want to have relationships anymore. God says, uh-uh, start having relationships again. And start having babies again. Start having grandbabies again. Because I do not want you to diminish. I want you to increase. I don't want you to lower. I want you to get higher. I don't want you to lose. I want you to gain. I want to come to somebody right here right now. A lot of times we are in a situation that is not good. We don't like it. We're not okay with it. And we say, you know what? I'm going to put up a resistance movement. I'm going to challenge the situation. I'm going to show them that I'm, I'm this and that. God is telling you, my friend, don't resist. Can you imagine a city, a, a nation that was deported to equal to about 3,000 people, but the city of Babylon was populated with over 100,000? Could 3,000 people actually defeat 100,000? No, they couldn't. And so my brother and sister, God is saying, it is effective... I go back to that word again from last week. It's effective to, to, to grow and, and to find ways to deal with the situation so that you don't become defective. <laughs> My brother and sister, hear me carefully. God has put you in a situation that you don't like. It doesn't make sense. It's not time to diminish. It's time to grow. <laughs> it's time for the leaves of your tree to bloom. It is time for you to show what you are about because your growth in a place of confusion prepares you for the place of peace. 
What you are developing now is going to prepare you for the next position. Perhaps God is preparing you to be the next CEO of your company. But if you don't take time to develop your leadership skills now, when you are simply a rank and file employee, when you are simply at the lower level, when you don't take the opportunity to develop your leadership, guess what? When you're elevated, you are not there to meet the challenge and you're going to be aggravated you're gonna be upset you're not gonna be there and you're gonna look inefficient so the place in which you are in now the position which you are in now your financial status now your health now uh, your family status it's not time to say ah 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 it's time to be like oh yeah what can i do <laughs> what can i do in this situation because when you embrace uh, the new normal and you grow then you prepare yourself for the next level. And so in, in order to be prosperous, in order for prosperity to breed in you, because that's God's way, you need to, to grow. Here's a th uh, third thing I want to tell you about. In verse number seven, the word of God that says, and seek peace of the city. I hope you're hearing. And seek peace of the city where they have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof, ye shall have peace. Now, what God asked them to do was like somebody spitting in a glass many times and filling a glass with spit and telling you to drink it. God asked the Israelites, the Judahites, in Babylon to pray for Babylon. God says... You need to seek the prosperity of the city in which you are in. Yes, you need to embrace your new normal. Yes, you need to grow in your new normal. But you need to make sure that in your growth and in your embrace, you are seeking the prosperity of the nation in which you are in or the situation in which you are in. Instead of being reactive and receptive and, and simply adaptive, you need to be proactive in doing your part to ensure the prosperity of the situation. Because when the situation in which you are in is prosperous, you're going to prosper. If the profits of your company are, are high, guess what? Your bonus is going to be high. Ah, can I preach it like I feel it? You see, you see, when you invest in your family and your family is happy and they are they are well taken care of, guess what? You are going to be taken care of. When you invest in your church and you do your part, guess what? Your church is going to bless you more. Many times we don't seek the prosperity of the place in which we are in. Many times we are focused on ourselves. But God says, and I say based upon what God says, you have to be proactive enough. Because when you're proactive enough, you're only blessing yourself. You're only increasing yourself. So perhaps right now, you need to start praying for somebody you never pray for. Perhaps right now, you need to start investing a little bit more of your time in your company, in your church, in your ministry. Do more. Stop sitting there and saying this and that. Get involved. Do your part because you're only benefiting you. Whew. Brother and sister, hear me carefully. Here is a principle of, uh, uh, man, I'm, I'm not trying to come up with words, but it's, it's a boomerang effect. You do it to them, they do it for you. Right now in this new normal, what can you do to be a benefit and a blessing to your environment, to your position, to your place, to your family? Because when you do that, then you are on the way to prosperity. You are transferring yourself from adversity, this thing. You are, you're dealing with this thing of adversity, and now you breed prosperity. The last thing is this. You need to avoid wrong messages. You see, in verses number 8 and number 9, the word of God says, For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, 
let not your prophets, listen to this carefully, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in front of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreams. <laughs> Sometimes it's not good to have a dream. Sometimes you need to have no dreams. And, and verse number 9 says, for they say, for they prophesy falsely unto, unto you in my name. I have not sent them. Uh, you see, in the time of Jeremiah, this was about 597 BC. This is about 500 years or 600 years before the birth of Jesus. This is when this story took, took place. Uh, there some prophets started walking around and say, you know what? Jeremiah is a liar. And I want you to know that I'm the true prophet of God. And I'm going to deal with this idea more next week because I couldn't deal with it today because of time. So come back next week. Uh, but I'm going to deal with this a little more, more in more detail next week. But Jeremiah says you need, uh, you need to not listen to the wrong messages. You see, sometimes when you're in a new normal, and what has happened, especially at this particular moment in COVID-19, there has been many messages flooding us, telling us this, telling us that, do this and do that. In fact, one uh, highly uh, powerful man said that you can, you can get rid of COVID-19 with disinfectant and ultraviolet rays. And I'm like, that, that's, that's crazy. But that's the kind of messages that happen because when there's a, a new normal, we are looking for that word. We're looking for that message to encourage you. Isn't it true when you, when, you, when you are dealing with a breakup, you want that word of encouragement? You know, somebody to come to you and tell you, it's going to be okay. Somebody to come and tell you, she's no good for nothing. Somebody to come and tell you, he's no good for nothing. When you lose that job, don't you want to hear somebody tell you, oh, that boss, forget him. You know, we, we look for messages. And if you're not careful about the message you listen to, it can hinder your prosperity. But when you listen to the right message, the message of God the message that he has prepared then you are able to navigate the situation and therefore what happens is the adversity truly becomes prosperity and you enjoy the blessings that God has for you brother and sister embrace it brother and sister grow in it brother and sister invest in it brother and sister uh, don't avoid the wrong kind of messages and when you do that you're going to be prosperous Amen, and you're going to be okay with God's way you're going to be okay with God's way you see the life of a student is full of adversity students have to overcome the adversity of four years in college. They have to go to classes. Sometimes the classes are early, six in the morning. Sometimes they are at an, an unholy hour, right after lunch. Sometimes they are late at night. Sometimes students have to do group work. And sometimes their group members do not do the work. And they are left doing all of the work. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, sometimes you stay up late and you study hard. And when you have studied hard, you have, you have done the assignment, you're ready for the test, you're ready to hand in the assignment. The teacher comes in and he says, I have moved the date. And you're like, Lord, I stayed up all night and I'm, I'm tired. But a student will press on. A student will move on because there is a crown of promise. The crown of promise is graduation. The crown of promise is certification. The crown of promise is qualification. And it doesn't matter four years. It doesn't matter two years. It doesn't matter six years. But a student will press on because there is a crown of promise. I need you to understand that in God's way, there is a crown of promise. In God's way, there is a something that you're going to get at the end of the journey. After you have traversed adversity, and after you have traversed prosperity, you are going to get to the place of promise. Allow me to tell you what I'm talking about. In verse number 10, God says, listen to, my, listen to me, brother and sister. He says, for thus saith the Lord. In verse number 10, listen to it. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished a Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Allow me to, to, 
to, for you to soak in this verse for a little bit so that you can get the gospel alive, real, and in color. Hey, listen to me, my brother and sister. You see, God says, when 70 years are fulfilled at Babylon. Now, the King James Version here doesn't do good justice to the text. Because in the Hebrew, it's a little bit more descriptive and more impactful. God says to them, after 70 years are brought to the mouth. In other words, God is saying, they, they, it's like filling up your mouth with water. He says, after 70 years are filled up for Babylon, and then I will visit you. Now, now you have to pause right there and say, uh, Lord, what are you talking about? God is saying, the 70 years, they are for Babylon. The 70 years are not for you. They are for Babylon. Because Babylon is going to rule for a certain period of time, but eventually they will be deposed and you're going to come back. God says, I will bring you back. I will repair. Re Re, I will bring you back. I will take you from deportation and re, re... I can't even say the word. I will bring you back to your homeland. Because that is my promise for you. But the 70 years, the 70 years are for Babylon. Let me talk about 70 for a second. You see, the number 70 either can stand for a committee. Like this, the Sanhedrin, which was a group of 70 men. It can stand for... A committee of evangelists like the 72 disciples Jesus sent out to preach. Or it can stand for judgment. So what I see, you know, the, the, the Lord telling Israel, the, the, the people of Israel, 70 years are either going to be judgment or they're going to be good news. In other words, at the end of 70 years, you are either going to be more prepared or you're going to be less prepared. I'm either going to deal with you like Babylon or I'm going to bring you back to Jerusalem. We all have a 70, we all have 24 hours in a day. The difference is how we use the time. My brother and sister, God has given you 70 years. In fact, I love the idea of 70 years because it shows to me a lifetime. It shows to me a lifetime. What it tells me is this, is that each and every one of us has been given a lifetime, 70 years. Whether we're in Babylon or Jerusalem, we have 70 years. And the key issue is, what are you going to do with the 70 years? Are you going to grow in the 70 years? Are you going to be proactive in the 70 years? Or are you going to regress and diminish in the 70 years? You see, it tells me something else. Some people are going to go to Babylon and never come back. Some people are going to die in Babylon. But by living in Babylon and having kids in Babylon and having marriages in Babylon, they were preparing the people who would go back to Jerusalem. So sometimes 70 years are not for you. You may not see the promises of God in your life. You may not see the goodness of life in your, the goodness of God in your life. But your kids will see that goodness. Your church will see that goodness. Your community will see that goodness. Your, your, your environment will see that goodness. And so brother and sister, take courage. I don't know the time frame that God has, has set for your life. But you need to utilize them for, the, for a blessing and a benefit to those around you. Somebody say amen. amen. 70 years. 70 years. 70 years. That's all we got. The question is, how are you going to use 70 years? You see, I need you to know something about the promise of God. You see, the promise of God is dated. It's dated. God says, I'm giving you 70 years in Babylon. I don't know your struggle, but I want you to know that it is dated. It's incredible that God told the Israelites 70 years. God has never told me, Henry, um, uh, I'm going to bless you in two years. God has never, <laughs> I've never heard a message from heaven. And neither have you heard a message that, okay, I'm going to bring you a big bonus in uh, three years. I have not heard that. But here, the incredible thing is God is telling you and I that your struggle 
Your situation is dated. It has a time frame and a time limit, an expiration date. You're not going to be in the struggle forever. I'm going to change you and bring you from a, a place of confusion, Babylon, and bring you back to Jerusalem, the place of peace. God has envisioned for you, and I want you to know it may not be here on earth because we have 70 years, but when Jesus Christ is going to come in the clouds of glory, somebody say hallelujah, when he's going to break the, the, the clouds and, and he's going to descend and we're going to hear the voice of the archangel and the call of God that is when we're going to get the crown of promise and the 70 years will finally show us that adversity has a has bred a promise and finally we are with God once again brother and sister take courage I'm sitting here to tell you keep on keep on and keep going on and because when you keep going on there is something good at the end of the tunnel so it is dated it is dated it is dated. The second thing I need you to learn is that the promise of God is defined. In verse number 11, uh, this is a favorite verse. In fact, I didn't want to dwell, dwell too much in this verse. But in that verse, the word of God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God does not work in a fog. He works with clear blue skies. God has defined your life. He knows exactly why, what he wants to do in your life. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. God knows exactly what he wants to do in your life. The reason why you're struggling is because God has a plan. Amen. He wants to give you a <laughs> Come on, say amen again. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. God, man, the words are failing me right now. You see, the reason why you don't have money is because God has a plan. You are sick, God has a plan. You are fired, God has a plan. God just doesn't put you in a place and say, we're going to figure it out. You know, sometimes you are put in a, in a position where people tell you to figure it out. No, God has figured it out. He knows exactly what's going to happen at the end of the situation. God is not surprised that you got promoted because he I wanted you to be promoted. God is not surprised that you got demoted. He wanted you to be demoted. God is not surprised that you got, you, you got married. God is not surprised that you got a baby after praying for so, many, for so long. God is never surprised. God defines our life. He has outlined it. He has put point by point, sub point, illustration, application. I'm telling you as shamanic development. But God is so detailed. God is so organized because you are that important to him. So it is dated, the promise of God. That crown is dated. It is also defined. But I love this last one. It is, it is, oh, this one, listen to this. It is directed. Yes. It is directed. God is a, is a better director than Martin, I can't even say the word. He's, he's a better director than Spike Lee. He, he's a better director than any of the best movies you've ever seen. He is the best director. And I want you to see something here in the text in verse number 12. Here's what God says. Look at this. This is beautiful. He says, Then you shall call upon me, and you shall go up and pray unto me, and I'll hearken unto you. You see, the reason why God led the Israelites to Jeru from Jerusalem to Babylon is because really he was leading, he was leading them to him. He says, look, after adversity and prosperity, the crown is me. Now, you know, I talked to somebody and they, they said to me, uh, Henry, it's my birthday. What gift are you going to give me? And I said to them, I'm the gift. He says, nah, I want the real gift. See, some of us, we want the money. We want the girl. We want this and we want that. You understand what I'm saying? But here God is saying, it's not about that. It's about me. I'm the promise. I'm the one that I want you to have. Because when you have me, you have everything else. 
Brother and sister, hear me carefully. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. The promise is Christ himself. And here, brother and sister, I want to talk to somebody. The adversity and, and the challenges you're having, they're simply a means and a way for you to know Jesus Christ. Lord knows that I'm talking to somebody who has never accepted Jesus. Or Jesus is not the main thing. But today is the day you can say, you know what, Lord, I want to find you. I want to be able to call on you. I want you to be the center of my life. Because when he's the center of my life, it doesn't matter if you go to Antarctica or you go into, into a typhoon or you go through a hurricane. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, he's going to be there waiting for you. Brother and sister, the promise is dated. It is defined, but it is really directed to God so that God can be the center of your life. And when you accept him at the center of your life, your life then has a center. It is going in the right direction. And you know that now I'm living life. Some of us are not living life because Jesus is not the life. Jesus is the truth. The way and the life. So you may not be okay with God's way. But when you embrace God's way, you're going to find the way. Amen. You're going to find the way. You see, for me, Jeremiah 29 is Exodus 2.0. Because his people go into a foreign land. And there God says, I'm going to bring you back to your land. Your homeland is not to be in a low position. Your homeland is not to suffer with sickness and disease. That's not your homeland. That's a foreign land. But it is God's intention to deliver you from a foreign land and bring you back into your homeland. Because when you have been to the foreign land... You begin to see what God means. And when you go back home to your homeland, you appreciate God better in your homeland. So brother and sister, hear me carefully. God wants to deliver you. He wants to change your situation. The question will be, are you willing to be okay with God's way? Are you willing to say, you know what, Lord? If you lead me through adversity, it's cool. And, 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 and if I must struggle to be prosperous, it's cool. But as long as it's your way, I'm good with it. And so my prayer, my challenge is very simple as I end this sermon. Lord, I want to follow your way, your will, and your wish. Please, Lord, strengthen me and guide me. Let us pray. God, thank you for your word. Strengthen us, lead us, and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.